Welcome back uh, to the new Irenics Protestant Podcast, the show where we strive to advance Protestant retrieval, theology, and ministry in the contemporary age by having conversations with the next generation of classical Protestant scholars coming out of Davenant Hall and those scholars who are forming them. I'm your host, Jonathan McKenzie. I'm a young classical Protestant currently pursuing my master's of letters in classical Protestantism from Davenant Hall. I also serve as the groundskeeper here in Landrum, South Carolina for the Davenant House. And uh, I am I am the uh, the host of this this year podcast today. I'm joined by uh, one of my co students. What's the term for that? Classmate. Yeah, uh, one of my my classmates, um, <laughs> Addison. Uh, him and I share most of our classes this semester. Somehow we've completely lined up. Um, so you know, I've I've only tired of seeing his face and and uh, every every uh, Tuesday we have uh, some back to back classes. Um, Addison, could you uh, introduce yourself a little bit? Um, tell us a little about you, your background, and um, what you're doing right now. Yeah, so I'm Addison Barton. Uh, I teach humanities and theology and Bible at New Covenant School up here in the upstate of South Carolina, where I'm also now, this is my first year, as the college and career counselor uh, and preaching chapel, uh, usually weekly, just kind of depends on uh, what all is going on. My educational background before Davenant is I minored in history, uh, sorry, majored in history, minored in Christian studies. Um, and I started grad school out at a NSA, New St. Andrews, and their kind of distance classical Christian studies mm -hmm. program, and then just kind of transferred over to uh, Davenant doing the MLIT pastoral ministry track with Reformed and Presbyterian studies. It's like the longest degree name of, of all time, but I'm enjoying it. Right. And you're in the ARP? Yes, I'm in the ARP. ARP and I'm in the PCA. You know, I I think we're the two best in a park churches, honestly, you know. Yes. You and know, I'm, people I'm, forget about the ARP, but it's bigger than yeah. the OPC. So. Yeah, it's just very regional uh, right. down in the southeast for the most part. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's great. I love it. Love the ARP. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, the ARP's revision to the the chapter on the civil magistrate, I, I much prefer it to our PCA revision. But alas, um, yeah. uh, I am where I am, you know. Um, I'm happy to be in the PCA. Yeah, um, I've been trying to track down the where they got that, basically, when they changed it to what it is and where it derives from the other changes that other churches have adopted. And I can't quite right. track it down. Right. Well, I think we'll, we're both in a lynch's uh, westminster confession course this semester and i imagine when we get to the civil magistrate he'll have a lot to say oh, uh, yeah. on on the topic and the history history there yeah um, and he also teaches the like presbyterian history in the u.s course as well so i bet i don't know i bet he can inform us of those things I hope so. um so um what so where, where'd you do your undergrad so I did my undergrad at Mississippi College, which okay. is just a small Baptist college right outside of Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. And where are you from? You like you seem you seem ambiguously southern, you know. It's hard for me to to hear you and know exactly. Yeah, so I'm from Mississippi. I was born okay. and raised uh in a suburb of Jackson called Flowood. Uh and okay. then I lived in Utah for a year after college and then moved okay. to South Carolina. Okay. That's great. And are you born and raised Presbyterian? No, I was um, born and raised Southern Baptist Okay, uh, and made the switch to the PCA. I think it was my junior year in college. Okay. Um, and then became ARP uh, when I moved to South Carolina. I settled mm -hmm. in an ARP church. Yeah. So I was, I was born and raised Southern Baptist um, and then made the, made the mental switch at some point in high school. Uh, right. Joined Presbyterianism when I went to college at RBC. Right. Um, and and now and and I had and I've been a a faithless uh, Presbyterian until recently, where I decided to really sell into the tradition. But that's great. Yeah. So, um, you did your undergrad history and you did some grad work with NSA. So, how did you get plugged into like the classical ed world? Uh, were you, were you were you homeschooled? What was, what was your own educational background growing up? Yeah, it's it was actually kind of random. So I did public school K through twelve. Uh, my mom worked in the counseling and administrative side of public education. So mm -hmm. that's where I came up. Um, even did my first two years of college at public colleges. I actually went to Ole Miss my first year and then a community college my second year and then just finished up my last two years <laughs> at MC. So uh, 
I didn't have private education until the last two years of uh, college. And getting into classical ed came about, I was living out in Salt Lake City uh, doing a fellows program through the PCA. I'm not sure if you or anyone in the audience would be familiar with those, but I was doing the Salt Lake Fellows. Okay. Um, and I worked in a public school out there, not as a teacher, but as a, essentially, but my, my title was student advocate, but I was a truancy officer. I tried to make sure kids went to class and got them back mm -hmm. on track, things like that. Um, but, you know, COVID hit the year I was out there. And so all of a sudden I'm just like sitting in my apartment in Utah. I'm like, I got to figure out what's next. Cause this, you know, fellowship ends in May. What am I going to do? Um, and my original goal was actually seminary. So I applied to RTS Jackson, um, love RTS Jackson. It's great. They were very generous, but just couldn't make the money work. And I wasn't going right. to, uh, to do, to do seminary. And so I was like, okay, well, I think I have the gift of teaching people multiple people have told me I have this gift of teaching. So I think I'd like to try that. You know, I'm young. Let's, let's try something out. Uh, but due to some other convictions I had, I knew if I was going to teach, I was not teaching in a public school. Right. Which I just was not going to do that. Um, at least not as it currently exists. And so I had read, I think it was Rod Dreher's the Benedict option recently mm -hmm. while all that was going on, which introduced me to what classical edu Christian education was. And then immediately it was like that, if I'm going to teach, that's the context in which I want to do it. So I literally, I just went on the association of classical Christian schools job board and I applied for like almost every upper school humanities position that was in a location that seemed even remotely doable. Wow. Uh, so I applied because I was in Utah at the time. I applied to a lot of schools in Colorado, Idaho, Washington, but then of course a ton in the Southeast because that's where my family is. Uh, and then just ended up here in South Carolina and I've been here ever since. How long have you been there now? This is, um, I think this is my fourth year. Okay. Yeah, this is year four. So having, not having, uh, I've had a background in classical education prior to, you know, deciding you want to go into classical, how, how'd you kind of make the transition? Cause I, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's a very different, uh, mode of teaching and different philosophy of teaching. Uh, so what kind of influenced you to say, not just Christian schools, but Christian mm -hmm. classical schools, um, and what kind of influenced that initial, you know, change there? Yeah. So, um, yeah, wanting to do the Christian part is kind of obvious, you know, mm -hmm. being Christian. The classical part, it's once I learned what classical education was, um, I realized that that's kind of what I had been hungering for. Mm hmm uh, I remember like my junior, senior year in college getting ads from all these what were called liberal arts colleges like St. Mm -hmm. John's. And it would come with like a book list of all the stuff you're going to read. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. And parents were like, no, that's not practical. You need to go somewhere else, um, which is what I ended up doing. But even when I went to Ole Miss, I was in the honors college that freshman year. And the honors college had been sold as you're going to read Thucydides and Herodotus and Plato. And we didn't read any of them. Um, I, I did get to read Karl Marx though. So that was fun. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so they, they gave me that, uh, you know, and it, once I realized that that's what I was hungering for, that was the term classical education, right? right. Engaging with the greatest minds of Western, you know, thought. I said, that's what I want to do. If I can do that, obviously mm -hmm. that would be much more interesting. Uh, the problem was how do you give someone an education you yourself did not receive, right? If right. you want to help someone else know, you need to know. Uh, and so basically I just kind of started on a quest of, I think I read Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. Mm -hmm. And then just from there started digging into the Western canon, just kind of dropping in wherever. I wasn't really systematic about it. I didn't follow some specific list. Um and I was honest, I said on all my cover letters, like, hey, you're going to look at my resume and see, I do not have a classical ed background, but I'm hungry to learn. Mm -hmm. And I will I will consume anything you put in front of me, any mm -hmm. sort of training or reading you need me to do. Uh, and then the guy who was headmaster at the time decided he liked me and that he'd take a chance on me. And here we are. There you go. There you go. Yeah. During that initial dive into the great tradition, just cannonball jump in. What uh, was it like a specific work that really like, hooked you in and you're like, man, this is this is what I want to be teaching the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, so my thesis in college was medieval history. So I always most of the jobs I was looking, at, I was trying to look at something where I would probably have to teach other things, but I could do medieval stuff. 
Um, and for me, it was a uh, Beowulf. I just, I love yeah. Beowulf as a text. Um, and then I also, yeah, Shakespeare specifically, uh, Macbeth and mm-hmm. much ado about nothing. Henry V, those plays just really hooked me. And it's like, man, so there's a, there's a world in which I can be honest about these texts with students and enjoy them together. If that exists, that's, that's where I want to be. Mm-hmm. So now you've been teaching for four years, um, and you said, I think you said you, you teach uh, history, you teach theology, Bible, you preach. Am I missing? I'm missing one on that list. Yeah. So we do uh, our. We have an integrated humanities. Okay. I do um, ancient or classical humanities, and then our medieval mm-hmm. humanities, which covers your literature, history, theology, philosophy for those. Okay. Pages. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Um, and what age group are you usually teaching? So those classes are ninth and 10th grade. Uh, okay. I do have um, an eighth grade New Testament class that I do. And my systematic mm-hmm. theology class is 11th and 12th grade. Okay. So I oh, go all the yes. Time. What are you currently doing for your systematics course? How do you, how do you teach your 12th, 11th, 12th grade systematics? Yeah. So that one, um, it comes up every two years. Okay. So it's on rotation. And then when it comes up, both 11th and 12th graders take it. So everybody okay. ends up taking it before they graduate. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've only taught that one once. And I'll definitely be revising how I do okay. it. The last time I taught it, I did it through, um, I used R.C. Sproul's Everyone's a Theologian mm-hmm. and the Westminster Confession of Faith, mm-hmm. uh, which was fine. I think, right. I think it was good. Uh, that class is much more lecture heavy than my humanities classes are where you're like reading a text and then debating it. Um, Cause it's very much just like a subject. And then this book is just our textbook for the subject as opposed mm-hmm. to understanding the text itself. You know, there's nothing altogether that interesting about Sproul's everyone's a theologian. Right. Um, but great book, nothing against mm-hmm. it. Uh, so yeah, we just kind of, we walked through those. And then in the background, I was using a lot of other systematic texts. Right. You got to fill in the gaps. Like I was looking at Bob Inks, wonderful works of God. Um, mm-hmm. I had recently taken a class on Calvin's institutes at new St. Andrews. So I was pulling a lot from that. I was pulling from Burke off. Um, and then just kind of with that first class, kind of seeing what do these 11th to 12th graders know and not know. So therefore what do I need to spend more or less time on? Mm-hmm. And that's great. Cause the second year you teach a class for me is always so much more fun. Cause you have like right. a baseline level of what you're walking into mm-hmm. and you can just design it so much better. Right. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to teaching that one again next year. That's great. So, so you're in the class club world. Uh, you're, you become a teacher. How'd you get hooked up with um, the Davenant Institute um, firstly, and then Davenant Hall? Yeah. So I think it all kind of st- I think I first found Davenant when I was still living in Utah and I don't remember exactly how it came up. I was going through an interesting intellectual development um, where I was moving out of presuppositional thought, Mm -hmm. kind of like looking for resources on that. I was moving out of libertarianism into um, perhaps more conservative, you know, political Mm -hmm. theology basically like the standard thing, like all the stuff Davenant does, right? So their name is coming up everywhere. I got into a couple of Facebook groups um, about like Protestant recovery of, you know, pre-modern exegesis and Mm -hmm. classical apologetics and classical methodology and scholasticism. And so Davenant just kept coming up everywhere. And so I started following them online. I bought a couple of their books and started reading some of their stuff. Um, I was like, oh, wow, this is great. And then when they launched the master's program, I was very compelled. Mm-hmm. But I had already started, or I was about to start the new St. Andrews thing. So I was like, oh, right. I'm just going to do that. But then as Davenant had a couple years under its belt with Davenant Hall and then reformed a little bit, reshaped it, I was like, no, I think I think that's what I want to do. So I transferred over um, and started with Davenant last fall. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... What I'm curious, what was your initial, um, you know, I think a lot of us here involved with Davin have been were, have been through our presuppositional libertarian phase. I definitely did before I got I got. Um, well, I went I went through that. Then I went I went to like a covenanter and then to an FV phase and finally got to classical theology later. Um, you, you did a bit oh, yeah. more direct route. Um, but 
Yeah. So what was, um, you know, I think a lot of the reformed world kind of a lot of us get into the reformed world and we think presuppositionalism and something like a libertarian uh, political theology is kind of like the default. So what kind of led you initially to um, move out of that into a more classical theology and, and to where you would be introduced to Davenant? Yeah. Oh man, there were so many things and it, it sounds like rude, but it really is just reality there. It, there's something about libertarianism that it has this logical consistency about it. That's really fun to play with in your mind. Um, of just, you know, I can be as consistent as I can be with the NAP and no one Mm -hmm. can stop me, you know? Right. Um, but then just actually getting it's, it's stereotypical, but getting out of college and then living in the real world, you realize, you know, this just doesn't provide answers for most of the stuff I care about anymore. Right. And I think it was, um, I'm going to butcher the quote, but I, th I think it was Richard Weaver who essentially said something along the lines of really, you should be judging movements based on the people in them, not just mm -hmm. by the ideas. Right. And I just realized I didn't like libertarians. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, they're, they're weird. And so that's <laughs> when I started to explore other options, but I wanted something more grounded because I could see the problems with just, you know, modern day liberalism mm -hmm. ever. And so just started exploring on the internet from there and then came across Davenant and a bunch of other sources. But, you know, I went through, you, you mentioned FV, like I've read a lot of Doug Wilson. Um, right. In many ways, that was part of the intellectual development that led me to Davenant, right? He's right. always talking mm -hmm. about classical Protestantism. Yes. Whether I may disagree with some of the things he says is classical Protestantism, right? He, mm -hmm. he uses that term. Um, and he's very big on like, yeah, go read the sources, like go read the reformers, go read the church fathers. Right. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you get in that circle doing those things, you're going to come across Davenant. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. And I think that's Davenant is kind of a sort of post FV sort of project. Right. I mean, a lot of the, the main, the main minds and figures in Davenant like were, you know, in their early twenties during the whole FV controversy, Right. And they kind of saw, you know, these FV guys are asking like these sort of questions and are, you know, kind of quote mining, you know, the reformed for base sacramental quotes. Yeah. And but also like none of them are actually like spending you know, a whole lot of time on primary primary reading. And you have all these young guys actually go do their primary reading. Yeah. And they come out very much not presuppositional or FV, but very much a different thing from the modern evangelical reformed landscape. Yeah. Um, and it is kind of interesting how you have movements like that that kind of nudge you in the right direction. You just can't, you just can't hang out there too long. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, yeah. And, 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 and things like theonomy, right. Cause like theonomist kind of asked a lot of good questions and probably gave a lot of poor answers. Sure. Um, but I think that, 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 that theonomy discourse from the reconstruction is kind of set up uh, for an eventual retrieval of classical Protestantism. Right. Cause instead of just, based quoting about god's law you can actually go and read the primary sources so exactly um, i think i think that journey is a journey that i know a lot of people in davenant have have been through um so now that you kind of been in davenant you've been reading these you know davenant materials how do you think that's like affected you as a classical educator uh in the classroom i um, mean your own thoughts and approach to education sure yeah it's it's affected it in several different ways on the one hand it's just always interesting to see how different um teachers organize different courses and approach mm -hmm. different types of texts and see would that work or not in my context they kind of play with those things uh and then just being on the receiving end of a more text-based socratic pedagogy right because that was never a thing i had in my education right being able to you know take colin redimer's um you know plato's seminar where he just kind of sits there for the most part quietly for the first hour of the two and lets people kind of talk about the text to get their ideas out there and go back and forth, you know, mm -hmm. and then he might guide it here or there and things like that. So getting to witness that I think is way more useful than reading any book on Socratic pedagogy, right? Like actually getting mm -hmm. to witness it. Um, there are also content things that, that have come through. Um, I have, they're definitely getting classical apologetics and understanding of um, classical theology for me mm -hmm. right there's uh there there's a few curricula pieces that we use that are a little bit more presuppositional in their approach that i have then kind of filtered out that out mm -hmm. i would say um 
not that my students aren't aren't at complete liberty to be presuppositional. Right. Of course. That's just, yeah. that's just not my approach. Um, so it certainly had an effect there. And then, I mean, just different classes, just straight up the content, of course, <laughs> as an effect. Um, I do teach some Bible. So a lot of the stuff we did with uh, Brad and natural law and scriptural authority mm -hmm. definitely comes out when I'm teaching Romans um, and other texts like that. Um, this semester with Westminster Confession mm -hmm. is obviously going to come out in a lot of the theological stuff I do in my systematics class. That's been great. And then just, uh, I mean, we're both in classical rhetoric for preaching, right? I right. Preach chapel. Mm -hmm. Because that's been a blast to try to talk out, like, how is it that we should really approach this and what should we be doing? Because I did not have a lot of preaching experience when I started that part of my job this year. So it's been cool to kind of like grow in that, just kind of like on the ground, having to do it every week, while then also being over here, taking classes, discussing the theory. And so um, just in those different ways, both in getting to witness their pedagogy, right, and analyze that it has affected me as a teacher. And then also just the content finds its way in as well, just inevitably. Mm -hmm. Right. And because I think students, students get excited about what the teacher gets excited about. Right. Right. So if something's happening in one of the classes I'm taking with Davenant that I'm really excited about some idea, if I can make it organically fit into what I'm doing in the classroom and get, right. have that energy kind of go through mm -hmm. it, it's really, really effective um, and been very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, this semester we've had um, Westminster Confession and uh, Classical Rhetoric for preaching together. Um, wait, are you are you also in my uh, Tolkien class? Yep, we're both in some. Uh, Although I'm, <laughs> I'm just a lowly auditor in that class. Though. Right, right. I'm literally yeah, yeah. just there to read Tolkien and talk about it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting doing these two classes uh, because I think they're maybe some things that are often familiar to people in our crowds, you know, like classical rhetoric, you know, I know about pathos and ethos and logos yeah. and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, I usually feel very uh, familiar with the Westminster confession. Um, but my own experience this semester has been, there's been a lot of surprises that have come in yeah. these two courses. I don't know. Is, is there anything in these two courses that you've done that we've been talking about this semester that has kind of surprised you about these familiar topics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Westminster class as a whole, I mean, I feel like every week I'm like, wait, what, what, what's going on here? Right. Uh, which has been a blast though. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's been so much fun and it's definitely given me a hunger to go read more of the divines. Right. Like, I'm, I'm really interested in digging into Anthony Burgess, mm -hmm. um, when this class is over and I have more time for my own, my own reading and yeah. And rhetoric too, because, you know, I've read a little bit of classical rhetoric here, there, but I don't teach rhetoric. Um, right. Another teacher in our school teaches rhetoric, but I hit on aspects of it that come up in different books, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so that one's been a lot of fun. I don't know if anything we've done on rhetoric yet has just been like hugely different than what I've seen right. before. Uh, taking Plato with Colin last term was a huge shift. Mm -hmm. um, not just in how I understand Plato, but in how I approach ancient texts in general. Okay. So that one had a massive effect in how I kind of approach my entire like ninth grade class mm -hmm. and, and the text that we study in that class. That one had a, a very profound mm -hmm. effect. When you say it affects the way like you read ancient texts in general, could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, with my background in history, you know, it's in the liberal arts, most people would say, but I, I did not get training in what you might call close reading. Mm -hmm. especially as uh, as applied to literature um and so what i one of the big things i learned in that plato class because i was really frustrated at first because i would go i would do the readings i would come to class and i'm like okay i am not getting what these other people are getting from this and i don't know what i'm doing wrong, right mm -hmm. and so i emailed colin we did office hours he mentioned some stuff in class on just approaching plato more as literature and how to read ancient literature and how um, and like he's mentioned it in, um, classical rhetoric as well. You know, when you're reading Plato, there's an exoteric and there's an esoteric teaching going on, mm -hmm. um, and just really paying attention to the details. Right. Right. And so, um, that played out this year, I just got done teaching the Aeneid. And so I was like, okay, I need to reread significant portions of this 
this year, like try this methodology. And there are just huge points that because I don't have an ancient literature background, I right. never missed. Uh, so for example, at the end of book six, when Aeneas leaves the underworld, uh, there are two gates, one where like the true dreams go through to the world and one where the false dreams go through. And he goes through the gate of false dreams, which is really curious. Right. Because he's just had this whole trek through the underworld and has seen all these visions about the future glory of Rome. And then he leaves through the gate of false dreams. And that's a fascinating thing to notice and discuss that I just totally missed mm -hmm. uh, the first several times, you know, I had read it. And just about every ancient text, I think almost, maybe not all of them, is kind of like that. Um, another example could be like Aeschylus in the Eumenides. Are you familiar with that one? I'm not, no. Yeah, so it's he wins this award in Athens at this festival for this great trilogy of plays, you know, Athens, the center of democracy. And the way the the last play ends, it's just this very arbitrary Athena lets Orestes off because she doesn't she always votes for the guy because she doesn't have a mm -hmm. mom because she sprung from Zeus's head or whatever. And you start to realize, like, hold on, he's actually totally undermining democracy. And what on the surface looks like he's praising democracy, like things like that, that right. I'm sure people who are in that world, that's old news. Mm -hmm. Right. But to me, this is all very new and wonderful. And, right. and Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, even this semester, you know, when we're, we were reading the Gorgias uh, for classical rhetoric, I mean, I, I read it. I enjoyed it. You know, I thought Socrates is really, you know, doing some stuff right here but it blew my mind when colin started talking about it right yeah and how and how he, he's like because i because i kind of approached it as like oh the gorgeous like the point is is what plato really thinks is in socrates mouth and yeah. i'm gonna read socrates and that's the right that's the right answer which is a pretty like not i guess it's, it is a very naive approach to reading reading plato I, i've seen and mm -hmm. and you kind of have to think about the dialogue uh you got to think about the whole context, all the information, the setting, we you know where where the thing's happening, the crowd that's there, who's all involved. Just when someone stops right. talking, they're still there listening. Yeah. And Socrates isn't necessarily always talking to Callicles or um, whoever his opponent is. I mean, his I mean, really, he is trying to redeem Gorgias, right? And even even the beginning of uh, the you know the dialogue in Greek, which Colin pointed out, you know, uh, is like war and battle, right? right. And that, I, mean, I would I had never picked up on that. But that's like the point of this. Mm -hmm. Socrates kind of goes and like, oh, I want to talk to this guy. And it's like, no, yeah. like the idea is he's going to go in. He's about to go to war, you know. Yeah. Um, and so those insights. Uh, yeah, that's blown my mind. Um, so it's, if you're at home, sign up for all the Redmer classes that you can. Absolutely. Yeah, we're we're Redmer stands here. Ab absolutely, absolutely. You know, what got me into Davin it really was the Adfontis podcast, which he was doing uh, oh, with, yeah. with Anzi and Anzi and Reese. Oh, um, yeah. hearing hearing him and Anzi bicker every single week, and him just yeah. use Redmer to get under people's skin. You know, that's you know, maybe fall in love with Colin Redmer. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, uh, to wrap up. Um, one question I always ask everybody that comes on the podcast, you got, you got five minutes. Why Protestantism? Why Protestantism? Um, if we're honest, part of it, at least in the beginning, is because, you know, I was raised Protestant. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, I was born and raised into a Protestant culture. Um, and you're always more inclined, I think, to what you're raised and enculturated in. Right. Um, but as I started to investigate things, I think, um, you know, this one of the stereotypical answers, you know, sola scriptura, right? Mm -hmm. Just scripture being at the top. But even more than that is because when you put scripture at the top, I think you're more free to engage more of the Christian tradition honestly and then appropriate whatever right. is good and whatever is true mm -hmm. in a way that you're not necessarily free to do in another tradition. Right. And so, um, you know, it's not unusual, especially in Davenant circles, to see Protestants, you know, reading Eastern Orthodox scholars or Roman Catholic scholars or, you know, this obscure philosopher over there, because with the, our understanding of God's two books, we have that liberty and we really can trace or find the truth wherever it is and appropriate it because it's ours. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just for the life of the mind, that, I mean, that's one of the one of the reasons I'm Protestant, right, is yeah. I can honestly engage everything i'm, I'm mm -hmm. free to do that yeah 
sounds like what you're saying too is like the seat of security, right? Because I have a sole infallible standard, you know, Yes. as as our, as our highest standard, I'm actually free to think all these things to kind of have a single infallible source to judge them all by. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a great answer. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, we're gonna end the, we're gonna end the day though with the spotlight. Yeah, thank you for having Uh, me. our spotlight uh, for today is. Um, Uh, Davenant is releasing finally at long last an actual John Davenant book. Uh, so right now, uh, pre orders are open for On the Death of Christ, uh, a new translation of John Davenant's uh, uh, massive work on the nature of the atonement and its extent and how it how it works. Um, and also, uh, and it's translated by Dr. Michael Lynch, and there's even um, new untranslated uh, letters. that Davenant writes to some French reform guys that have never been put in English before. So it's an entirely new translation. It's going to be great. It's going to be the, the greatest publication of the year, in my opinion, uh, no matter what you think on uh, issues of John Davenant and the atonement. Uh, so I highly recommend that you go uh, and pre-order it. Uh, the pre-order pre price right now is $35.95. Um, it'll be $47.95 when it releases in March. So I'll put a link down uh, in the description. And with that, thank you all for tuning in. Bye-bye.